Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning we meditate on the giving of the Holy Spirit to the church by our Lord Jesus. I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Well, as we heard our Lord Jesus speak those words in the Gospel lesson this morning, uh, we heard him speak them on, on that first Maundy Thursday, right? And, and as we listen to them, though, we see why we're celebrating the, the day of Pentecost and do so right after celebrating the Ascension. When Jesus says, I must go away, that's him talking about his Ascension. And when he talks about then him sending the Holy Spirit, that is what we have at Pentecost. So we have him going up to heaven, sitting, being seated at the right hand of the Father, and we talked about that last week. We talked about what that means for us. That, that that means that he is with us. But we understand that presence to be with us by the Holy Spirit whom he has sent. And what I mean is both that we understand that he is present with us because the Holy Spirit gives us that insight and because the Holy Spirit actually is the one who mediates Jesus to us, who brings that presence of Christ to us somehow. Now, as I say all of this, uh, you might know that Pentecost actually is one of my favorite days in the church here to preach on. And I think I say this every year. I, I love Pentecost because, because I think the Holy Spirit really is the hardest person of the Trinity to understand. Right? Creation and, and fathers and redemption and sons. I, I think we get all those things pretty, pretty easily because that's pretty concrete. But then there is the Holy Spirit. I always like to ask that question, who is the Holy Spirit and what does he do? And notice I say he because he is a person, right? So who is the Holy Spirit and what does he do? Well, it's a little bit harder of a question than the Father or the Son, isn't it? You know, think about how we, we talk about this in the Creed. Think about the Father. We, we attribute to the Father the act of creation, to the Son, we attribute redemption. You know, so creation and redemption, those are things that make sense. But what do we attribute to the Holy Spirit, if you can think back to your confirmation days? Well, we attribute sanctification to the Holy Spirit. Well, what's that, right? Well, as I often say to the confirmands, sanctification is to be made holy. It's holification, if you will. But what is that? Well, consider what we actually say about the Holy Spirit in the Creed itself. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. And as we say that, what we're doing is we're saying this is all the work of the Holy Spirit there. So, so there we see the Holy Spirit is gathering the church. Right? I believe in the Holy Christian Church. We believe that he's gathering the holy people, the communion of saints, and we can understand this, the, the gathering of the holy people around the holy things, that is, the, the things which give the forgiveness of sins. And all of this so that on the last day we will be raised and we will live forever with Jesus. But as I say that, let's come back for a second to this idea of the holy people gathered around the holy things which give the forgiveness of sins. And as I say that, I, th I think we pretty well understand the forgiveness of sins, don't we? And by that I don't mean like rationally because it's irrational that God would forgive our sins, but I think we understand the concept of how God does this, right? That's what Jesus did on the cross. But the way that Luther says this is he says that it's on the cross that Christ won our forgiveness, right? It's on the cross that Christ earned that forgiveness. But how does the cross, which was 2,000 years ago-ish, and 6,000 miles away-ish, how does that get to us here and now? Well, we say through those holy things. What are those? Well, first and foremost, it's the Word. It's the Word, whether the Word is in the Scriptures, or whether the Word is preached, whether the Word is attached to the absolution. 
And it's the Word as the Word attaches itself to the waters of baptism. And it's the Word as the Word attaches itself to communion, as we'll be having later today, despite the fact that we don't have it up here yet. We are having it. But that's why I'm always pointing you to these things. It's because this is where the Holy Spirit promises to bring Jesus to you. And that's what makes you holy. You are then holy people. People holy because you have received the forgiveness of your sins which undoes the sin which makes you unholy. And as we always speak of being saved by grace through faith, then you receive that by faith. right? I often say that faith is the container that receives faith like, like a stomach is the container that receives food. Right? But in all of this then, what you can see is that the work of the Spirit relates back to Jesus and what He has done. As I was reading Luther on this this week, he said that the Holy Spirit bears witness to Jesus, and so this witness would be the Holy Spirit's sermon. I always lo- love the way Luther says things. I thought, what an interesting way to say it. This is the Holy Spirit's sermon that He would speak Jesus to you. And we actually see Jesus confirming this in in the gospel lesson that we heard from John, right? He says, and when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will speak not on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare the things to you that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Jesus saying that, right? Jesus says he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And what is Jesus? It belongs to him the forgiveness of sins, life, salvation, all that declared to you. So with that in mind, I think we should be drawn then to the picture that we see in the Old Testament lesson, right? that, that passage from Ezekiel. And in fact, you know, it talks about loving Pentecost. I love the image that connects to Pentecost that we see in that that passage from the Old Testament. I think I've I've touched on this before, but I I don't know that I've really focused on it that much. But look at how beautiful the imagery is in that passage. Right? Think about it. What do we see in that picture there? Well, we see Ezekiel, and he's being led to to this valley by the Lord. And and as I say that, we might think of like a valley in, in, in the western U.S., and you might think of it as sort of having lush vegetation, you know, and often in valleys you've got the mountains that, that sort of collect the, the precipitation that falls and the precipitation all, all flows down the mountain to, to the valleys. So the valleys tend to be somewhat lush, right? But you have to understand that in much of Israel it's not like that. There are, there are definitely valleys that are, are somewhat fertile. For example, when, when I was there, we went through the Valley of Jezreel, which is up in the north. It's near where, where Mount Carmel is, if you remember the story of, of Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. Or, or if you, you think about where Nazareth is, that's, that's all up in that area. And it's, it's pretty green up there, especially when, in the spring where, uh, when we were there. But further south, it's dry. And I think especially how dry it is as you go east of Jerusalem. You go out of Jerusalem down into the, into the, the River Jordan uh, uh, Valley and, and you go to the Dead Sea and all of that. And it's, it's dry. It's bone dry. You know, not, not intending to make a pun with the, the reading, but, but it is dry there. And so you can, you can imagine that if an animal, or to tie more so to the, to the reading, if a person would die in a valley there, the, the bodies would, would dry up. And once those bodies would dry up, they would be very, very dry. And that's exactly what we see in the reading. But of course, what's this reading an image of? Well, within the immediate context of the story, it's it's a picture of Israel despairing because of the the conquest of of the Babylonians, right? They've lost all hope for their nation. And so, with that in mind, the dryness of the bones represents their loss of hope, right? The, 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 the thought that you're going to resurrect a body that's that dry is seemingly hopeless. All hope is gone for them then. They're, they're cooked, so to speak. But let's take a step back from that immediate context and look what's being said more broadly in that, within the, the, the context of the reading, uh, a little bit broader. Um, 
it, you know, and, and what I mean by that is that as the reading continues past where we have for this morning, you go past that, and it actually talks about the, the, this hope being of the king, this hope coming of the kingdom being united under a new King David. Now you see, this, this prophecy was given uh, centuries after King David ruled over Israel. And what had happened is that David had ruled over the United Kingdom. His son Solomon had ruled over the United Kingdom. But at, among Solomon's sons, the kingdom had been divided. And you had the, the, the kingdom in the north, and, and that kingdom had been overtaken by the Assyrians at some point before And then the southern kingdom, which as I mentioned, was conquered by Babylon. So the kingdom had had not been united. But then the Lord promises a new David who would unite the kingdoms. So do you know who that new King David would be? Well, it's Jesus. Jesus is the king who would unite not only the Israelites together, but Jew and Gentile in his kingdom. Jesus is that ruler that fulfills this Old Testament passage. It's all about Jesus. Well, let's come back to the story itself. So so since this relates to something greater than just that immediate context of the the Israelites fearing this conquest by the Babylonians, we see that the picture of these bones has more to do with that, or you know, more, more to do with, with life than that, right? It's them pointing to that eternal hope in Christ. So as we think of the bones in that way, then what do the bones themselves signify? Can you think of it? Well, it's us. It's us in our state of sin. We are so dead in our trespasses and sins that we are those dry bones. And what can dry bones do? Nothing, right? They can't get up and walk. They can't get food. They can't breathe. They most certainly can't unite themselves back together and put sinews on the bones and flesh on the sinews and skin on the flesh, can they? And that's us in sin. Of ourselves, we are dead in sin, spiritually speaking. And that's our dilemma. Isn't it? You know, as we think about how this goes, we can think about how we want to talk about the world being a better place and how we should all be the change we want to see in the world. And and we should, right? That's true. Especially as Christians, you should be going out, we should be going out into the world and loving our neighbors. Do that. Right? Be willing to sacrifice yourself for your neighbor as Christ was willing to sacrifice himself for you. But know that the state of all of us in sin is this death. But let's go a little bit further with that. Let's make a connection perhaps to this, this hope that the Israelites have or don't have. And I say that because I think we can relate to that, can't we? Think about how often we look at our culture around us, and I have to acknowledge myself I do this, right? I look, at, I look at the culture around us, and I see it straying from the Christian understanding of the world. And I, and I do so even with fear that society will ultimately turn against us as Christians, and that we'll experience earthly suffering for it. Maybe, I, maybe not in my lifetime, but perhaps more likely in my children's lifetime or their, li- their children's lifetime, Right? And as I say this, to be sure, it's, it's not wrong for us to want society to reflect what God desires of it. Right? We should want that. We should speak to that even. But as we're worried about things like what I just expressed in myself, we also have to live in the hope of the eternity with God. We have to recognize that Christ has told us we will be hated by the world. And we have to acknowledge it when we see what happening, things happening around us, but despair, then we show ourselves to be those dry bones. And so I think we can relate to those bones in our time. We can relate to looking at the world and despairing. But look at what happens to those dry bones in Ezekiel. Well, Ezekiel is told to, to prophesy to that wind, which he does. And that wind 
connects to the Spirit. You see, it's the same word in Hebrew, wind and spirit. So what Ezekiel is doing is, as he's prophesying to the wind, he's prophesying to the Spirit. He's calling the Spirit to come upon those bones and bring them back to life, to put them back together, to put sinews on the bones and flesh on the sinews and skin on the flesh. Christians, this is what happens to you by the work of the Spirit. Yes, you are dead in your trespasses and sins. You are dead in your lack of hope. But here comes the Spirit. The Spirit is spoken into your ears, spoken into your hearts, and He renews you. He gives you new life. As we we lack hope, then remember that He gives you the new life in Christ which has overcome the world. He gave you that life in the the waters of baptism, the the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Spirit, as Paul calls it in Titus chapter 3. And in doing this, He makes all of you that army that Ezekiel saw in his vision. You are made anew. You are given hope. You are brought out of the dryness of that death. That is the work of the Holy Spirit, Christians. That's exactly what He does. He brings that forgiveness of Christ to you and He raises you in the resurrection of Easter. He brings you Jesus in His sermon. He brings you Jesus in the Word, in the absolution, in baptism, in the supper. And He makes you alive. And we might try to make this abstract. We might try to make this like a secret revelation that we have to feel around to understand and attune exactly what the Spirit is saying and and, and that kind of thing that we might hear it. But it's not that hard. It's simple. It's in the Word. There the Spirit is. Speaking Jesus to you. Pointing you to Jesus. Giving you that faith in Jesus that makes you holy. And in doing that, He raises you in Jesus. Raises you to hope now in the waters of baptism and raises you in the hope of the eternal resurrection of your body and soul on the last day. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. This is most certainly true. Amen. Now may the peace of the Spirit guard your hearts and your minds in that faith in Christ Jesus and to life everlasting. Amen.